So, I wanted to talk about the effect that winter has on mast cell activation syndrome um, because that's really important to understand if you're somebody who's newly diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome or if you have long COVID because that's what long COVID is. Um, there are a lot of things about winter that can really worsen your symptoms and it's just important to keep in mind that it's temporary. It doesn't mean that your symptoms are going to be this bad for the rest of your life. It's because of winter, okay? So that's the first thing. It's just like, it's temporary. And to be clear, when I say winter, I mean the season where it's cold. So if you live somewhere where winter isn't where it's cold, then just interpret this as me talking about whenever it's cold. Any, any form of heat, any source of heat, is a mast cell trigger, is an inflammatory trigger. And so when you have your heat running all the time, your mast cells don't really like that. And it doesn't really matter what type of heat you use because it's the heat, <laughs> right? An ideal setting for me <clears throat> would be somewhere where I never had to run the heat because it's just a nightmare having to live with the heat. I've had apartments where I couldn't control the heat, where the landlord did. And it was just torture. Like, I don't run the heat. <laughs> and one thing that does work for me that I, sh I strongly recommend trying, because it's easy to try, is to use a heating pad to keep yourself warm. So normally when I work from home, I sit at my desk, I don't run the heat, I don't have a space heater, I just am sitting on a heating pad. And that way, you're controlling where the heat is really affecting your body. Because when you're in a room with a radiator, like your whole body is just being baked, right? When you're sitting on a heating pad, then the brunt <clears throat> of the inflammation that's gonna happen from that heat is happening in the, the very large muscles, you know, of your butt and your thighs, your legs, right? They can handle that. I'm, I do not suffer when there's a lot of blood in those muscles, the way that I suffer when there's a lot of blood in my skin or a lot of blood in my esophagus, or a lot of blood in my, this, the, the trigeminal neuralgia, the red ear syndrome, it's just so good, like, there's nothing that compares to just sitting on a heating pad when it's cold, because then you can still breathe, <laughs> which is really great. I can't really have anybody ride in my car with me in the winter, because, like, I don't run the heat. If I run the heat, I, I won't be able to breathe. My throat will close. And even to the point where sometimes, like, I'll roll down the window in the winter. Like, and, like, so, you know, I, I'm not in Minnesota right now, but when I lived in Minnesota, you know, sometimes it's, like, negative 30, right? So in those conditions, I would turn the heat on in my car, but I would still leave the window cracked so that I could always get cold air to breathe. And that, you know... In terms of seasonal affective disorder, getting the heat situation sorted made such a huge difference. Because I'm telling you, I know it sounds crazy from the perspective of learned immune system allergies, but since we're talking about innate immune system allergies, like you, ha you have to understand that heat is always going to be an inflammatory trigger. Just like humidity is always going to be an inflammatory trigger. It doesn't, it doesn't really even matter the conditions. Those things are always inflammatory triggers. And then another thing to keep in mind when it comes to things that are worse about innate immune system dysfunction in winter is comfort foods. So I've talked before about how comfort foods are foods that are more inflammatory. And that's why they're comforting because they draw blood away from your brain and other places where you might not want them to be into your digestive system. And that produces a sense of calm. But if you have an overpowered inflammatory response, then that experience goes from being calming to being harmful. So if you have long COVID, if you just have a lot of allergies, a lot of food allergies, stuff like that, it's more important to be careful about what you eat in the winter. We are lucky in that, you know, globalism has enabled us to kind of eat in a way that's not dependent on the season because the foods that traditionally would have been available in the winter are all very high histamine foods because the older a food is, the greater the histamine response. So, you know, 
free all this crazy capitalism stuff, you know, you you canned, you dried stuff, you know, you, you found ways to preserve it. And I'm not saying that those types of foods are toxic, but I'm saying they produce more inflammation. The older a food is, the, the more shelf-stable a food is, the more inflammation that it's going to produce. Um, so be careful about what you eat in winter or where, whenever it's cold. You know, and like, obviously, holidays are a thing, and food is a big part of holidays. And so I'm not saying don't eat people food on, th on Thanksgiving or on Christmas, because that's really isolating. To not be able to eat anything that, that everybody else at the table is eating. So I fully support cheating on holidays, but I, I advocate for cheating when you've been really good for like a couple weeks beforehand so that you can get away with it. And, you know, this is less of a thing because of COVID, but I'm sure it's still happening on some level is, you know, these, these holiday parties with all these people wearing all these fragrances, all these different products. And so if you have to go to a party like that, find a place with good air circulation, step outside as often as you can, or just step into a, you know, a spare bedroom or something. Just take a few minutes to breathe, just to sense where you're feeling inflammation in your body and then when you regulate your breathing, because your breath and your blood pressure, when you control your breath, you control your blood pressure. When you control your blood pressure, you control your inflammatory response. So, it, you know, it's not like you have to sit in there for 15 minutes and meditate. You can do it in 30 seconds. Sometimes it takes five minutes, you know. But it doesn't... It doesn't take that long, and you can do it however many times you need to. No one's going to think it's weird if you just step outside every 30 minutes. And that will make the, make the experience a lot more pleasant for you, a lot less unpleasant. It will enable you to get away with eating those cheat foods with less uh, havoc being wrought in your body. And... It'll keep those memories from being inherently traumatic because your body was in a physiological state of trauma regardless of the fact that the people you were around might have been people that you enjoyed being with and that there was nothing inherently traumatic happening on a social level. And, you know, noise is a thing here too. When the vestibular system is stimulated, histamine is released. If you have holes in your skull or you have thin bone in your skull between where the ear processes sound and where it processes movement, then that means sound is going to trigger the release of histamine. A lot of sound will trigger the release of a lot of histamine. So just take breaks. Just step outside as often as you need. It's such a small thing and it makes such a huge difference. And... Um, another issue at holiday parties is alcohol. So even if you don't drink alcohol, which if you have innate immune system dysfunction, I highly recommend never drinking alcohol because there's really it, there's nothing good about it. Everything that that does to you when you are in this state of innate immune system dysfunction is bad. And there's it's just cannabis is so, so much a better option. But if you're in, at a party and everybody else is drinking, the reality is that that alcohol is going to evaporate and hang in the air because that's what alcohol does. So... If you're going to go to a holiday party, you know, talk to the host beforehand and say, okay, what's the alcohol situation? Is there going to be a space or can we create a space, just a room where there's no alcohol in that room? And I don't have to spend every single minute in that room, but I can go to that room whenever I need to. Because 20 people with, with open, open beverage, there's so much alcohol in the air, you know? I will go into anaphylaxis from just stepping inside of a bar because alcohol hangs in the air so much. So that's really, really important to be cognizant about and to be intentional about if you are gonna to go to holiday parties, is exposure to alcohol, because it will end up in your respiratory system. <laughs> Sorry, no way around it.
Okay, so I talked about heat, I talked about food, I talked about parties, vitamin D. Let's talk about vitamin D. Certain people, probably not everyone, cannot tolerate synthetic vitamin D, D3, calcif calciferol, is that what it is? D3. And obviously, when you're talking about winter, you're talking about needing to look at other ways to get vitamin D. So there's nothing wrong with the idea of supplementing vitamin D. It's just that it's incredibly important for people who already have a need immune system dysfunction to not supplement with synthetic D3. Just get that cod liver oil. It's worth it. It's so worth it. And I, it's, it's hard. It's actually really hard to find a vitamin D food sourced supplement that doesn't have added synthetic D3 in it. I'm taking one right now that's like, you know, most of it's from the cod liver oil and then some of it's synthetic. And I can tolerate that small amount. But that's because I'm really careful about avoiding other fortified foods. The more fortified foods you eat, the more important it is to avoid synthetic D3. Because I tell you, it does not work for some people. It is incredibly harmful for some people. It does the exact opposite of what we think of vitamin D as doing. It doesn't help your bones. It destroys your bones. If you have a pre-existing imbalance between magnesium and calcium, then synthetic D3 will destroy your bones and it will destroy your organs and it will destroy all the tissue in your body. I cannot stress enough how important it is to avoid that. And again, some people can tolerate it, but a lot of people can't. And a lot of societal ills can be mapped pretty clearly onto when calcium and synthetic D were added to food fortification programs. They used to say cutting was the addiction of the 90s. Guess when they added calcium to fortified foods, like the end of the 80s? It takes a few years of, you know, constant mineral imbalance to start seeing serious problems. And I would say that something like cutting is probably the first and mildest symptom of long-term mineral deficiencies. You know, it starts with these emotional and behavioral problems, and then it can quickly progress into serious physical illness. So that's another one. Get your D the good way, the right way. And avoid foods with added synthetic D. I'm trying to think if there's anything else about winter that people need to know. But yeah, fabrics. So, because of the reality of living in a world where people run a heating system all the time, you know, it's kind of unavoidable to be in this more reactive state during the winter. So another thing that may not be something that you need to consider all the time, but may be something you need to consider when your symptoms are worse, like in winter, is the fabrics that you wear. You have a lot of mast cells in your skin, like a lot, and they're the most active. Um, and you know what? They Sometimes they don't really like synthetic fabrics. Uh, and obviously I understand that, you know, organic cotton, organic linen, whatever, that stuff is expensive. Like I'm not, I get that. Like I wear synthetic fabrics cause I can't always afford really fancy stuff, you know, but it's just important to understand that that can be a consideration and that can worsen your symptoms. Also, um, if you have, you know, innate immune system dysfunction, because the mast cells in your skin are so active, um, you can have what's called. I think it's dermatography, it's skin writing, literally. And what that is, is it's a form of pressure urticaria. So in the same way that heat and humidity are just inherently inflammatory triggers, pressure is inherently an inflammatory trigger. So if you're wearing something that's tight against an area all the time, that's going to constantly draw more blood to the area. And so 
that can be bad. Sometimes you don't want that, right? It can make it hard to concentrate. It can make it hard to digest food. It can make it hard to physically relax your muscles. It can make it hard to do anything, right? Like, and, and when you have this inflammation that's happening in a place often, while you're in a state of mineral imbalances, then whenever there's inflammation, then more and more minerals are getting deposited there, right? So this is kind of a humorous overstatement, but to illustrate the, the point that I'm making here, like bras cause anorexia <laughs> because you wear this tight band around your diaphragm, your stomach, all that stuff all the time. And it brings more and more blood and it brings more and more minerals and all the tissue mineralizes and it doesn't function. It causes gastroparesis. Of course, you're not going to eat when you haven't digested the food that you ate last time, right? Like that's not a psychological problem. It's a medical problem. Eating disorders only manifest with this psychological twist because of our culture. The basis of eating disorders is, is biological. It's not ideological it has nothing to do with perfection it has nothing to do with beauty it has nothing to do with control except insofar as those things happen when you have chronically um elevated histamine levels and stuff like that you can't cure anorexia with therapy you're wasting your time you know there's a kind of an assumption in the eating disorder community that kind of like with alcoholics it's like you never recover right you're always a recovering anorectic for the rest of your life and you know what that's not true it's not true you can recover fully you don't have to live like that and you don't have to spend the rest of your life fighting not to live like that all you have to do is get histamine under control and it goes away. It just goes away. I can't tell you the last time I weighed myself. I can't tell you the last time I even thought about it. You know, like they, they weigh me at the doctor's office and I just don't even care what the number is. I don't care how many calories I ate yesterday. I don't care how much I how many calories I burned yesterday exercising compulsively doing thousands of sit-ups alone in my room at three in the morning that stuff's just not a part of my life anymore and I didn't even work on that stuff in therapy believe me I worked on a ton of stuff in therapy but I didn't ever work on that stuff because I didn't need to because it just got better when I got all of these factors you know histamine mineral imbalance when I got all that under control, it just disappeared instantly. That's what I need you to understand. You can get better. You can get all the way better. I'm in a super stressful situation right now. And you know what? I just feel fine. I feel better now than I ever felt when I had security and material abundance, but too much histamine. It's freedom. Getting histamine under control gives you freedom. Freedom from yourself. Freedom from your idea of what you think it has to be, because it doesn't have to be anything. Nothing does. And there's nothing that is more valuable than freedom from what you think it has to be. <laughs> so that's why I won't shut up about all this stuff.